This painting by Willem de Kooning is called Visit. Now de Kooning is seen as the archetypal existential painter, the pioneer of chaos and improvisation and a kind of angst-ridden expression in paint. And the mark making here, you can really feel the grinding gestures almost and uh, the violent gestures with which uh, this painting is put together. Now it's plainly not an abstraction completely. Out of this chaotic gesture making comes the image of a naked woman. You can see her face here and her smile, the lurid colors of the flesh, her open legs. Of course, there's a long history of male painters depicting the female nude. And this might be seen as a rather violent, uh, corrupted, even decadent ending to that tradition. The artist Willem de Kooning made a notorious and disturbing series of paintings, the Woman series, showing figures with big breasts, ghastly smiles and splayed legs, all painted with extreme aggression. These paintings overtly performed sexism in a way that abstract work could not. But what room was there for women in the epic, masculine, heroic world of abstract expressionism? Carol, who was now Mrs. Bill Johnson, took a general home economics course. Not one which would lead to professional employment, but one which fitted her for that very important career of being Mrs. Johnson. The 1950s was not a great time to be um, a woman artist. It was very difficult. Gender divisions were incredibly rigid at this point. Um, socially as well as um, within the art world. And so it was incredibly difficult for a woman at this point to have anything that looked like a professional career. So even artists such as Lee Krasner, who um, subsequently goes on to marry Jackson Pollock, of course, had participated in the mural division of the WPA. She um, trained as a fine artist, yet still, even though she had some success during the um, 50s as an artist, it was very much overshadowed by Pollock. And I think that what happened with painting like de Kooning's and Pollock's was that uh, the angst, the angsty language that was used to describe their work instantly became coded as very masculine, mm. which by default means that women can't operate in that way. And it presumes that women um, don't have access to um, aggression and destruction, that these are somehow masculine traits, which of course is deeply problematic. This painting is by Lee Krasner, a Gothic landscape, 1961, very large abstract expressionist painting. It's highly gestural. And if one imagines the gestures that went into making it up, particularly these thick black bars that swoop across the entire landscape, you can see that those gestures are expressive, perhaps even violent and suggestive of strong emotion. The blackness of those bars suggests something about the depth and the negative character of that emotion. She's made a picture, but then there are these marks which begin, which form the picture, but also come close to erasing it. Lee Krasner is a very serious and committed painter in her own right, long before she becomes involved with Jackson Pollock. She's trained uh, with Hans Hoffmann, another uh, artist who's linked to abstract expressionism. Ah, and he praises her, and I'm sure in a way that he thought was liberal at the time. And he would say things to her like, this is a wonderful painting. You can't tell that it was painted by a woman. And she talks about the, the cold slap of that, of that comment and what it meant. To 
identify as a woman, as a woman artist, was anathema to your career. So if you had any serious ambitions towards being a professional artist as a woman, you really didn't want to be pigeonholed, as they would um, say, as a woman artist. This was something that was really complicated for artists, particularly ones like Krasner, who was very well known as being um, married to Pollock. So Krasner's response seems to be to play down her, her femininity. Yes. She always signed as LK. She wanted to ensure there was no... Um, well, she was happy with the ambiguity because professionally, to say you were a woman, as soon as you declared your name on the canvas would have been, I mean, professionally damaging. Grace Hartigan early on signed her paintings, George, um, hmm. apparently. So this was... Um, like George Eliot. Exactly, and she said that she kind of took this as a, as a motif and that she knew that this was the only way to, um, to establish yourself. And even into the early 60s, we have artists such as Lee Bonticu, who was very happy with the ambiguity of her name, and she always said once people realised that the Lee meant that she was a woman, um, interest waned quickly. Oh. Krasner appears to see painting as a way of escaping gender stereotypes. And it's logical that she does this, because if we think about the ideology of abstract expressionism, it's all about the autonomy of the work, the work being a world in itself. The idea of the autonomous work as a gender-free space was, unfortunately, something of an illusion. Krasner herself never really got her career going or, or, or had the recognition that perhaps she deserved. She was neglected, if not denigrated, by the male critics whose macho performances complemented those of the great male heroes of abstract expressionism. One of her formulations is wonderfully paradoxical. She said, unfortunately, I was very fortunate to know Jackson Pollock. A lot of feminist art historians have taken her as a limit case to think about this because you can't think of her as not married to Pollock. It wouldn't do justice to her narrative and her historical formation. But she tried to have a foot in both camps, I think. So on the one hand, there is certain um, narratives of her when journalists would come to interview Pollock, for example, um, for the famous Life magazine spread. Um, she was wearing an apron, um, I don't know, making jam or something. So somehow she's aware that to support Pollock, she needs to take a back um, seat. Sometimes it's just sitting on the stepladder behind him in his barn as he paints. She chooses to really present herself as the housewife, when we know that wasn't really how their setup worked. At this point, there was no language really to describe the kinds of um, dissatisfactions that women were feeling. And I think that for artists like Krasner, um, Frankenthaler, Joan Mitchell, Grace Hartigan, all these completely um, amazing and very important abstract expressionist painters, to find a means of expressing this was really complicated because, as I said, feminism wasn't something that, you, that even existed as a term one might hang one's hat on as a political identity. I'm not used to this kind of light and reeling at all, ever, so uh, forgive me if I seem a little strange. And I was interested in Frankenthaler, who seems to do mm. something quite different uh, from Krasner, in that um, her photographic representations seem quite feminine. I think um, with Frankenthaler it is rather different and I think that play because that photograph which is surrounded by her sort of pastel paintings there is this equivalence between the female painter and her works and you have to wonder who's staging that photograph and to what ends. What's very striking about Frankenthaler is that she, like Pollock, painted on the floor um, but the language that's used to describe them is very very different and is very gendered. In fact, both Pollock and Frankenthaler would pour paint directly onto their canvases. Frankenthaler was um, quick to use unprimed duck cloth. Um, and so if you don't prime the canvas, the paint will seep in and it will stain. And Pollock would do the same. But whereas his um, pouring is, is 
talked about in rather angst-ridden terms, this gestural kind of expressive outpouring of self in a kind of angry, almost destructive um, vocabulary. For Frankenthaler, there was a language of fluidity and the slightly paler colours that she used, that she wasn't tied to the violence of the drawn line, that she was somehow producing something that was, I suppose, more decorative. And of course, these terms in the avant-garde are very, very loaded. And I think Frankenthaler did suffer from that, although she was quite clear that it was seeing Pollock. Um, it was his 1951 show at Betty Parsons, the big drip painting exhibition that for her was just transformative and she knew that she wanted to kind of work on this big large scale at that point. Like you went up to a, a Pollock show you said last night and it influenced you some way. Coming after um, Cubism, Kandinsky, Gorky, looking at the Kooning, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that that was the next step that sent me into my orbit. Uh, it wasn't as if I had gone from the 14th century or the Renaissance to light bulb, there's a man making enamel drips. Uh, I think looking back, though I wasn't very aware of it then, that there was a continuity in a sense, aesthetically. How did you get into scale itself? I mean, was it like just a... Uh a thing to put more color down, so well, you have more there. You cannot accomplish uh, on an easel size what the message is that you might be able to accomplish large scale. I wanted to ask about the Kooning, because I, mm. with most of these painters, uh, the, because of their abstraction, they're not at least representing women, but de Kooning does in the Furnace yes. series. Does this constitute another level of gendered prejudice or is this incidental in some ways to what he's doing? The de Kooning Women series is hugely significant. There's something kind of terrifying and very visceral about these forms with these enormous breasts and thighs. So these, these are not erotic, um, these are um, very violent renderings of women and painted with these very thick determined slashes and aggressive strokes again this is a kind of language that mm. you could use mm. to talk about these which is highly uh, gendered but that was how interestingly krasner read them she found them abhorrent she really really did not like de kooning's women series To have these very macho, masculine, all-American guys, in effect, meant that they couldn't have women as their peers. I think that that's been hugely detrimental to um, the way in which abstract expressionism was written about at the time. And that's the biggest kind of catastrophe for a number of these women at this time, is that there was no sustained critical discussion of their work at all. And that wasn't really to come for another at least 10 years.